Okay, well, do you want to move on to the next? Yeah, I'd like to move on to my, my good friend who uh, has been, have been a colleague and also an inspiration. And uh, also he's been very active as far as getting movers and shakers together. As I mentioned, uh, our next speaker uh, had a meeting with one of the, well, a lot of famous people, a lot of powerful people, James Cameron, the fellow who went with the submarine to the Titanic, who has made many valuable motion pictures, entertaining pictures. Uh, he has him involved. He's a very strong proponent of, uh, of helping save the planet. After all, he's a man who's greatly appreciated all the wonders of nature. Well, our next speaker, Jim Hicks, has been an important facilitator in getting people to take action. He's a, system, a systemic engineer, and he'll tell us what that means. He's the publisher of uh, three best-selling books that clearly explain, explain without compromise what we need to do to have a home. Jim? Can you enlighten us a little bit? Well, yes, John. I, first of all, I'm delighted to be able to participate in this conference. And I think you're, you're doing the world a great service by, by putting this out there. Um, my presentation that's coming up, it, it, it's all about the food to start with, but it, it's basically looking at, at an unsustainable situation that we have in terms of the way we live in the developed world. And, and the, the unsustainability uh, in, in the video, we'll go through the, the scientists and, and look at, at the data and the science. And, but I'm listening to Heather and, and we, need to, we need to have hope in this whole thing. And, and I try to put as much hope into my presentation as possible, but we also have to be realistic. And we have, my, my premise is as, a, as an engineer, we have to have a system of living and, and uh, that, that is sustainable. Individuals cannot create systems. That requires collaborative governments and huge organization, lots of capital. And so, you know, I, I try to make things as simple as possible. And uh, that's because I guess I'm a simple-minded in individual, but I wanna make sure that people can understand it. So the, the talk that I, that I, it took me a, a lot of time, John, to get it down from an hour to, to 20 minutes, but I'm glad, I'm glad you made me do it because it's, it's, uh, it's watchable. Uh, the average 11th or 12th grader would have no trouble understanding, I think, the big picture situation we're in. We need a whole system of living to replace what we have. And I believe that is possible, and I'll explain it later. But if something is possible using today's technology, all we need is the wherewithal, the desire to do that. And we can leverage the power of artificial intelligence and the power of systemic change and the power of food choices, number one, and also the power of leadership. And um, that, that, that's a key element that you know, we have 195 countries and thousands of religions. It's hard to get everybody on the same page. So to some, my presentation may be viewed as a fantasy. It is a fantasy because I'm fantasizing of what is possible using today's technology and how can we get there and how fast. And according to the 11 big picture scientists that are featured in chapter four of, of our book, Outcry, uh, they all have serious concerns about our survival beyond the year 2100. Uh, some, some much sooner than that think that uh, they think our demise will come much sooner than that. But I believe in optimism. Um, I have eight grandchildren. I know John has seven. A couple of them are yours, Heather, I think. And, but for all the children of the world, you know, if there's a way out of this mess, I think we have to focus on all of the things that need to be done, but give people hope by, by sharing with them what they can do. They can, they can change their food, number one, but they can also help start the conversation needed throughout the world that it's gonna take to attract the leadership and the money and the power to make systemic changes happen. Uh, 
I think artificial intelligence is going to play a key role. And uh, I talk about that a bit in the 20 minute video. So that's sort of the, the, the but I will talk a, a lot about what people can do. I think there's a lot of things individuals can do to buy us some time, you know, uh, consuming less stuff, for example, get out of the gift giving business at Christmas time and give services and give a free dinner or, or give an ebook that uh, doesn't have to be printed. And lots of ways people can cut back on consumption and thereby buy us time to get around to fixing our overall system of living. And you're a food guy too, right, Jim? I'm absolutely a food guy. Yeah. In well, let's see. When I started studying, uh, I got curious about the optimal diet for humans. And over the next six months between December and, and May of 2003, I found a lot of people. Number one was John McDougall. I found your work, started reading your stuff. I found T. Colin Campbell. I found Joel Furman, Neil Barnard, you know, Dean Ornish. And so that's really where it all started with me was the food. And then um, along about the time you and I were at James Cameron's ranch, I realized, you know, that I was, I was always thinking, we get the food right, we can buy enough time to fix everything else. Well, we're not getting the food right. You know, there's still more people in the, in the undeveloped world moving toward a meat, meat and dairy in their diet. And there are people in the in the North America and in America and Europe that are moving the other direction. So, you know, we, we have to get the food right and we have to do a lot of other things to buy us time for the collaboration to come together to change our overall system of living. And I believe anything that's possible can be done. Well, you know, the rest of the people involved in this, uh, this day also believe that otherwise. Otherwise, why give you the information? Have hope, but we all have to work really hard and there's an urgency out there to start now. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's hear the presentation, Heather. All right, here we go. Thank you, John. Hello, my talk today is entitled Donkeys and Spaceships, a quick look at crucial systems that shape our lives and our future. As for systems, my first exposure was at Auburn University where I earned a degree in industrial engineering. I went on to get an MBA at the University of Hawaii while serving as a junior officer at the US Coast Guard base in the middle of Honolulu Harbor. John McDougall and I were like two ships passing in the night. In September of 71, I left the island of Oahu to start my business career with Alcoa in Pittsburgh, just a few months before John and Mary moved to Honolulu. As for systems engineering, I learned two rules. First, make sure you understand the complete system before you start making changes. Second, sometimes you must start from scratch and replace the entire system. Trying to transform a donkey into a spaceship is one of those times. Both are transportation systems, but trying to tweak the donkey into a system that can fly you to the moon is not going to work. Let's take a look at a few of our systems of living which must eventually operate in harmony with the biosphere that gives us life. We have systems for feeding ourselves, transporting ourselves, and for keeping score. My conclusion is that we must totally re-engineer and optimize all of the systems of human activity on this planet. So how green is green enough? No one knows for sure how green we must live to survive. So I suggest that we challenge ourselves to err on the side of living even greener than mother nature demands. That's because we are likely to get only one chance to get this right. To be clear, we're talking about the urgent need to totally reinvent every aspect of the way we live as we create an overall system of living for humans where only green lifestyle choices exist. So how critical is our situation? I estimate that we must learn to live five to 10 times more sustainably than we are now. We're not gonna to hit that goal by simply tweaking what we, what we have. What do some leading scientists have to say about the melting ice and other phenomena that threaten our future as a species? Pictured here are nine of the 11 big picture scientists who are featured in chapter four of our new book, Outcry. You probably recognize Colin Campbell. 
all have grave concerns about our chances for survival as a species. Let's hear from six of them, beginning with the two who actually stress the crucial importance of food choices. Robert Goodland, the first ecologist ever hired by the World Bank, where he worked for over 20 years. He was the lead author of a 2009 paper that was published on World Watch. What if the key actors in climate change are cows, pigs, and chickens? So what was their bottom line conclusion? Our analysis shows that livestock and their byproducts actually account for at least 51% of annual worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, more than all other causes combined. Given that amazing 51% number, I pause to share this nature-friendly image from an opinion piece about the new administration's superior approach to fighting climate change. The New York Times on December 28th. Not a single word about food in the entire 2000 word article. A sign of the times. Next up is my friend and colleague T. Colin Campbell, the person who introduced me to Robert Goodland in 2013. At Robert's memorial service, I met and began collaborating with Jeff Enhang, the co-author of that World Watch climate paper. Colin is the nutritional scientist at Cornell who authored the China study along with his son Tom in 2005, a bombshell of a book that influenced former Bill, President Bill Clinton and millions of others around the world to adopt a plant-based diet. In his second major book, Whole, published in 2014, he drew this conclusion about the supreme importance of eating the right food. What we eat individually and collectively has repercussions far beyond our waistlines and blood pressure readings. No less than our future as a species hangs in the balance. Now let's hear from four others beginning with the most famous, Jacques Cousteau. We've passed the threshold. The beginning of the end has started. Man may or may not be part of the plan nature has for the earth in the future. Life will be reborn, but first the world as we know it now will die. Dr. Frank Finner, an expert on species extinction and the overall leader of the global team that eradicated the smallpox virus concluded at the age of 95 in 2010, shortly before his death. Homo sapiens will become extinct, perhaps within a hundred years. A lot of other animals will too. It's an irreversible situation. I think it's too late. And then there's Stephen Emmott, possibly the most informed big picture scientist on the planet. The last few sentences, sentences of his 2013 book, 10 billion. As a scientist, what do I think about our current situation? Science is essentially organized skepticism. I spend my life trying to prove my work wrong or look for alternative explanations for my results. I hope I'm wrong, but the science points to my not being wrong. We urgently need to do, and I mean actually do, something radical to avert a global catastrophe, but I don't think we will. I think we're effed, and he used the full word in the book without apology. James Lovelock scientist, engineer, inventor, alive and well at 101. This living legend grasps the relevant global big picture more completely than perhaps any other scientist in history, expressing this dire conclusion in a 2010 BBC film. When you see the whole picture, it is really fearsomely bad. I fear that not many of us will survive, at best about a billion, possibly a lot less than that. But he says, if the earth improves as a result of our presence, then we will flourish. If it doesn't, then we will die off. So here's the question of the day. Is the earth improving because of our presence? Dr. Lovelock also weighs in on a very troubling situation that is unfolding in the Arctic Ocean with the loss of cooling albedo, which is white ice reflecting heat from the sun back into space. On the other hand, blue ocean absorbs that heat. How much heat, you might ask? Lovestock, Lovelock answers that in the same BBC film. Just the melting of the floating ice in the Arctic Ocean will add as much heat to the Earth as all of the CO2 we have put in the atmosphere to date. 
And that is why I'm afraid that there's very little we can do with respect to all of our efforts to reduce emissions. This is a graph of the CO2 concentration parts per million for the past 300 years. Notice a sharp exponential rise in recent years going well above the safe level of 350 parts per million. This was last month, December 15th. That rapidly melting ice leads to temperatures that are rising much faster in the Arctic than in the rest of the world. As a result, that ice has already lost 75% of its mass and may be completely gone in less than 10 years. Tragically, most humans think that melting ice in the Arctic is a good thing. Three reasons, faster shipping lanes, tourism, and oil. Sad, but true. While our survival prospects appear grim, I am more optimistic than these big picture scientists seem to be, primarily because of four potential game changers where some of them may be lacking in knowledge, experience, or expertise. Bottom line, I am more confident than they are that we can learn to live in harmony with nature by urgently leveraging these four disciplines to completely replace our global systems of living with systems that can actually improve the biosphere. What system of feeding ourselves will we employ in the future? On a per calorie basis, on average, animal-based foods require over 10 times as much land, water, and energy as do plant-based foods. As such, there are serious consequences when we fail to take advantage of the low-hanging fruit, like simply changing what we eat. For if we cannot take the animal out of the equation when it comes to feeding ourselves, we will never learn to live in harmony with nature thereby placing the future of our civilization and our species in serious jeopardy. As for taking the animal out of the equation, I coined the protein myth a few years ago. Because of the mistaken yet almost ubiquitous belief that we humans actually need to eat animal protein to be healthy, a host of incredibly powerful plant-based solutions to the world's most serious health, hunger, and sustainability crises never even make it to the table for a consideration. Conveniently, a whole food plant-based diet actually reverses most chronic diseases quickly, thereby replacing a large portion of another one of our outrageous systems, healthcare. A little background, my journey began in 2002 when I first became curious about the optimal diet for humans. Later, after 15 years of studying about food and sustainability issues in general, in writing two books on the subjects, I finally arrived at my bottom line conclusion about the protein myth defined above. The next three slides summarize some of the urgent alarms from nature that are covered in part one of our book outcry. Drought, floods, fires, as is frequently reported, polar ice and glaciers are melting and coral reefs and rainforests are disappearing. And don't forget the fires. The bigger the circle, the bigger the fire on this 100 year graph in September, six of the largest 20 fires in California history were all burning at the same time. Birds, insects, coral, all crucial to our survival, all in terminal decline. What about those insects? From a 2019 study in Australia, half of all insects in the world will be gone in 50 years and all will be gone within 100 years. Without their pollination of crops, countless species cannot survive. Birds, bats, fish, reptiles, and mammals of every size and description, including Homo sapiens. Back to those systems, given the alarming concerns of the big picture scientists and the many alarms from mother nature, we best err on the side of living even greener than she demands. Let's take a look at two categories of our systems that need a lot of work, transportation and the economy. So how do we go about changing those systems? Buckminster Fuller says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model. It makes the existing model obsolete. So as we begin to redesign critical systems, we must get serious about those conclusions of the 101 year old scientist, James Lovelock, who said, if the earth improves as a result of our presence, then we will flourish. If it doesn't, then we will die off. Bottom line, we must have a vision and a plan. Good business leaders create a vision, articulate the vision, passionately own the vision, 
and relentlessly drive it to completion. I am convinced that willy-nilly infrastructure replacement around the world will not save us. We must have a realistic vision and a plan for a whole new way of sustainable living in order for us to survive and thrive on this planet. Let's talk about that vision. Transportation systems, here's what we have now. Billions of automobiles and trillions of airline passenger miles flown every year. We can make them obsolete using today's technology like 760 mile per hour hyperloop trains. In Outcry, we envision a system of living where only green options exist. A 3,000 mile futuristic living corridor near the Canadian border, 25 miles wide with a fabulous hyperloop system in the center, housing up to 300 million people in a total area about the size of the state of Oregon. World's largest farmer's market, full employment, no homelessness, and the same superior health care for all. What about the scorekeeping system, the economy? A totally nature-focused economy of the future. We definitely need a new system of living on this planet and whatever we design and build, we're going to need a brand new method of scorekeeping. We call it earthonomics, a way of keeping score on planet earth that rewards all actions of nation, nations and individuals to improve the biosphere and punishes those that inflict damage. Earthonomics replaces capitalism. Just think about the long-term absurdity of capitalism, an international scorekeeping system that guarantees the never-ending depletion of the Earth's finite resources until they are all gone. Obviously, we need a better way to keep score. As for that new global economic system, if we get the scorekeeping system right, one that is dedicated to improving nature, then many other issues will resolve themselves. Things like overpopulation, overconsumption, and the, the use of fossil fuels, etc. When all else fails, can AI save us? In a world with 195 countries and thousands of religions, it seems highly unlikely to this practical engineer that we will ever get these mammoth tasks done without a great deal of help from our robotic friends. They will make decisions based on hard data, not politics, greed, or religious beliefs. Dr. Lovelock agrees, concluding in Novacine, a book that he published in 2019 at the age of 99. We need not be afraid. We shall not descend into the kind of war between humans and machines that is so often described in science fiction because we need each other. Musk and Putin weigh in on the future of AI. Elon says, I am very close to the cutting edge in AI and it scares the hell out of me. It's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows, and the rate of improvement is exponential. And these chilling words from Vladimir Putin, whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. How urgent is our current situation? How quickly must we take action? We should be guided by this message of urgency from the straight talking governor of the state of Washington. We are the first generation to feel the sting of climate change and we are the last generation that can do something about it. For all the children of the world, we indeed must do something about it. For their sake, we must jolt ourselves into thinking differently, a process we describe in the final chapter of Outcry. First part of Outcry is all about the problem. Part two is all about the solution. Mother Nature establishes the theme of our book in the foreword, a brief excerpt. As a result of your failed stewardship of this planet, things are likely to become very painful for you in the future. But frankly, I have run out of patience with you and your selfish ways. Quite simply, you've become very problematic tenants who are now in serious danger of being evicted. How green are we living now in the developed world? My estimate between 10 and 20% as efficiently as needed. Consider the disaster for all the children. If we err on the side of taking out too few of our unsustainable habits. So as we plan our new systems of living, we must keep this guideline in mind 
when it comes to our questionable lifestyle habits. When in doubt, take it out. What about other countries? Well, they can build on our model, modify, improve, and replicate. The global conversation must begin now. As for that magical place described earlier, where only green lifestyle choices exist, is it the solution? Not necessarily. Can it help start the conversation? Well, I certainly hope that it will. James Cameron describes the current global dilemma on the cover of our book, then asks a simple question. How do we make the crash landing soft enough for some kind of continuation of human civilization? So how do we jumpstart that all important conversation? Simply by urging others to begin talking about it. Then when the conversation gets loud enough, maybe the 10 best known billionaires in the USA will pick, it, pick up on it and take it to the next level. If somehow they all got together and started talking about a completely new system of living, within a few days, the entire world would begin to think differently about our future. In closing, how do we save our biosphere? We listen to the troubling conclusions of those scientists as we envision and plan our future way of life, one that may or may not look anything like that 3,000 mile corridor. Again, that was just a visual to help spark a global conversation about the radical lifestyle changes that are not only appealing, but necessary. Sound crazy? Good, because people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. Are we crazy enough? If not, let's get crazy now. Join with friends to help spark the much needed conversation. Contact me directly at jmorrishicks at me.com. Visit my primary websites and other information that you might, might find here. From the Green Mountain State of Vermont, I wish you a very green and happy new year. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I'll tell you, if you didn't, if you didn't understand the urgency of the problem before Mr. Hicks's presentation, you must now. But we have tools. I mean, we have opportunities. I don't want to be in a situation where my grandchildren say, Grandpa, why didn't you try harder? I think it's an obligation of all of us to never have those words spoken by our children or grandchildren. Why didn't you try harder? You knew better. And the fruit is a very tangible thing.